Okay, welcome to Robotics 2. Uh, we are looking at chapter 9, which is on the state estimation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some background information, a little bit of theory part on what state estimation is, uh, how do we find out where the UAV is located, some introduction about the optical flow and other important concepts that are used in TELO and in MAMBO drones. And then what I would do is, I didn't bring my drone today, but I would show you about implementation of some of these inside the MATLAB. So what you can do is, if you have access to a, a Telo or Mambo drone, you can, after going home, uh, you can actually recreate the Simulink files or Simulink uh, uh, scripts or models, and then try to program your drones and get some real life or real a live video or some data from your Telos or from Mambos. So I would use Mambo. Before I begin, Telo Labs, everyone able to do it? Any question, concerns? Hmm? What? Yeah, so everyone, no extension needed, right? Okay, good. Very good, very good. Uh, next part is, I just want to tell you that I'm working on slightly different setup. The last lesson I talked about building a, a $20 quadcopter, which has the same functionality as uh, Mambo. So currently I'm working on that. So I don't know if you see, let me show you. So this is the teeny tiny micro drone. You can buy this micro drone on eBay for 10 bucks. Uh, it's very uh, hackable. So the idea is if you open up the, the controller, the controller has uh, the IR sensors for proximity. It also has IMU. It has a microcontroller and it has a barometer. So it's actually, I'm pretty amazed that they packed everything here and still you can buy this for eight bucks if you buy in bulk. Now this drone can easily be connected, attached to this Arduino uh, ESP32 based board. And basically you can program the firmware of this drone. So, if you are really excited, if you really want to get into uh, hands-on building your own Telo, or if you want to build in your own Mambo, you can do that for 20 bucks. So you have to get just get an Arduino uh, IoT. This Arduino IoT has a built-in Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and IMU. You can interface that with this drone and basically program it to follow the waypoint or you can program it pretty much uh, using MATLAB or Python. So this is something that I wanted to show you. And this is a lot of fun. At least I have a lot of fun playing with this drone. And I am teaching, yeah, question? Uh, this is a $10 UFO drone on eBay. You can get it for, I got it for $1, but you can get it for eight bucks. This is a very, very hackable drone. So there is nothing inside. So uh, if you open this up, there is a simple microcontroller. Uh, then basically uh, there is USB. The only problem is the USB port is not connected to programming port. So you cannot program the microcontroller. Uh, there are proximity uh, uh, IR LEDs. And then basically uh, uh, I, uh, 
there is a barometer it's I, i'm amazed that they you can buy this for uh, eight bucks with all this uh, instrumentation and sensors but uh, again i just want to tell you i'm putting together a kit so if you are interested you are welcome to take my uh, uh, mechatronics class in summer and in that class actually what we will do is we will hack this drone and go from scratch step by step and we'll build a flying drone so if you are 4 plus 1 student you can take that course if you are egr i mean if you are ms ras student you can take that course if you are any other master student uh, you can take that course course so if you are 4 plus 1 even if you are in the regular curriculum you can take that course in summer and the reason i'm just trying to get a number because as you know because of the chip shortage it's the the components are hard to get by so if i know the number of students then before the course starts i can put the kits together for you guys so the course is egr 550 and i would be i generally don't teach it but somehow i got an opportunity to teach that uh in this summer so If you have nothing else to do, you are welcome to take that course. Okay, so in today's class, I'm going to talk about first part. I'm going to talk about the the state estimation. So the idea is we talked about the Kalman filtering. Kalman filtering is the tool of choice when you are trying to find or estimate something based on noisy measurements. Everyone, uh, Kalman filtering lab. Any question, concerns? Were you able to do it or not do it? Kalman filtering. Okay. Where? Part three, or yeah, part three, class seven, which is coming up with like matrices A, B, C, and D. For now, I just saw there is a exact video. Yes. Oh, yeah, this video, copy video six of the seven page series, um, and then they show you the map and kind of how they got there, so which helps you. Where are the videos? <laughs> uh, Google Kalman filter lab map. Actually, I've put the videos in the uh, uh, announcements, and I was trying to play those videos in class, but they said, "Ah, oh, it's better use of our time. I will watch that later." So. that's why i didn't yeah okay uh, when is when is kalman filtering due tonight. tonight you guys need an extension on that okay since i'm feeling generous i will give you extension so it will be due thursday thursday is good thursday is good Okay. All right. So Kalman filtering lab, it will be due by Thursday. But I promise you, all the answers. That's why it's only two points. All the answers that you need to work out uh, the problem are <clears throat> given to you. So let's let's start. And in today's class, what I'm going to do is. Okay. It's for some reason disappeared. okay so we are going to talk about state estimation so please understand 
there is a difference between measurement and estimation so in measurement you actually know what the value is so you actually measure so you actually know so you have actual value in estimate it's sort of an approximation so you are guessing this is the guest value guest value and many a times you do not have access to the location you do not have access to the sensor or there is too much delay that's why you have to live with the guest value and hope that whatever you are guessing is the best possible value unfortunately that happens all the time because the sensors that we use are inherently noisy we don't live in a perfect world there are temperature effects there is drift there are uncertainties that corrupt the actual measurement so the how do we how do we deal with all these uncertainties but still get the best possible approximate value for the thing that we want to measure and that is the crux of state estimation and believe it or not there are a lot of things that we want to estimate the first one is attitude estimation attitude means roll pitch and yaw angle roll pitch and yaw angles so that is the orientation of the aircraft so this is basically attitude means orientation so so we want to find out what is the orientation of the aircraft next thing what is the position of the aircraft so when i say position i want to find out its x its y and z now attitude and position they are defined with respect to certain coordinate frame and most likely you are going to use earth center earth fixed north east down coordinate frame so you will have north you will have east and you will have down so this is the inertial coordinate frame with respect to the inertial coordinate frame you are going to represent attitude and you are going to represent the position the next comes is the velocity so you may say that hey if i know the positions from time to time i can find out the velocity but unfortunately it's not true because please try to understand you have a quadcopter and somehow you know the position when the quadcopter is at location a and you don't have a position update for say 2 minutes and then all of a sudden you have a position update when the quadcopter is at position b the amount of time between these two updates is quite high so it can't get you the approximate velocity so unless you are getting the positions update very very quickly you cannot find out the value of the velocity so how would you find out the value of the velocity then clearly what you do is if you have an inertial sensor like accelerometer three axis accelerometer you integrate the acceleration but as you saw in the kalman filtering lab and videos the accelerations are noisy so if you have a noisy acceleration please understand once you integrate so let's let's look at the acceleration so you have an acceleration and that acceleration is 5 plus minus 0.5 
which is the uncertainty that changes every time. So if you were to integrate, what's going to happen is you are going to multiply this by time. So you are going to multiply five times the time and you are going to multiply this uncertainty by time. So what's going to happen is you are going to see that your velocity out, your velocity that you find from acceleration is going to drift. If you find the position from the double integration, then it's even worse because now if you were to integrate the position would be acceleration T square divided by two. So as time goes on, you basically are squaring the time and that is adding to the uncertainty in position. So that's why you need better means to find the velocity. And that's why we use different types of sensors. Uh, you can use LIDAR, you can use optical flow, you can use IMU, GPS, some type of combination and find out the velocity. UAVs, they do not always fly in an environment that is clear and open. Many a times the UAVs fly in an environment that is cluttered full of obstacles. So you need some type of means to detect the obstacles. And again, these topics are, they could be a course in themselves. So I would just tell you that the velocity and obstacle estimation, many a times we used cameras, many a times we use more than one sensor to detect velocity to detect obstacles and navigate the UAV in a cluttered environment. And if you look at the Coursera course that you are going to work on, I think it's on the localization uh, course that you are taking. In there, you will learn the camera, camera transformations, all those camera modules and how to find out from the picture, how do you get velocities, positions? How can you construct the, the basic bounding block for the obstacle based on camera views? Now, let's, let's try to look at the, the measuring principle between pitch, roll, and yaw. So I want to tell you a very fundamental concept. We will look at the math. But what I want to tell you is I want to uh, just give you a fundamental concept between the pitch or role estimation. So let's, let's start with a very simple configuration. What I have is I have a quadcopter and this exercise is very important because at the end of this class, I want you to implement this simple algorithm inside MATLAB for Mambo. So, so I will actually, so note. To be implemented. on Mambo using MATLAB. And I will get you started. I will tell you what needs to happen, but you can actually implement this. So imagine that this is your Mambo drone. This Mambo drone has an IMU here. So this is an IMU. So IMU has three axis accelerometer and three axis gyroscope and it has three axis magnetometer. Now let's identify the north east down for this Mambo. So I'm going to say that this 
is my north. This is my east. This is my down. Now, pitch orientation is always about the east. So this orientation is pitch. So this is pitch. If I want to find out the value of pitch and the mambo is stationary, what I would do? So think about it. I want you to be looking from this side. I want you to be looking from this side. So if I have an IMU, do you agree with me that this IMU would be inclined if Mambo pitches, if Mambo pitches by angle theta, this IMU would be at inclined angle. The gravity vector will always point out in the downward direction. So the gravity vector is not going to change. Gravity vector will always be in the down direction. So this is gravity. So this gravity vector is going to act over here. So one component of acceleration would be measured along the frame and the other component of acceleration would be measured perpendicular to the frame. Are you with me so far? So one component of acceleration would be measured along the frame. Other component of acceleration would be measured perpendicular to the frame. So now let's identify the body axis for the IMU. So if I were to say, this is the body axis of the IMU. Then I would find out that this guy, which is G and this angle is theta. This angle is G. So this is going to be G sine of theta would be measured by, I'm going to call this A X. So A X is equal to G sine theta. So I can find out the value of theta by arc sine of A of X divided by G. Are you with me so far? So this happens in the very static case. Now, what happens if you add some motion to it? Now, please understand that this is the angle that you are getting from accelerometer. You also have a gyroscope and gyroscope is going to give you the rate. So for an example, I want you to visualize this particular case that you have this Mambo drone and you kind of slowly pitch it upwards. You agree with me, since you are pitching it slowly, the gyro reading will not be changing a lot, but acceleration will change a lot because acceleration or accelerometer is going to measure the specific force and the specific force is going to change. Now, let me make this case that if I rotate that uh, uh, Mambo very quickly, what would happen? The gyro would sense that quick motion, but accelerometer will be sluggish to respond. Are you with me so far? Because by the time accelerometer settles down to a particular value, that location has been crossed. So this is when the Mambo is moving slowly. Now let's understand if I were to pitch it quickly and I want you to try this and do this exercise. If you were to pitch it very quickly, then what you will observe is theta measured by gyroscope. And now please note, this is AX. This is gonna be GY is equal to 
gy which is the gyro output gyro reading multiplied by delta t are you with me so far so this measurement will be more accurate when it's fast are you with me so far now my question to you is how would you combine these two measurements so you have here is a very practical problem you have a measurement of theta this measurement of theta is very very accurate when the motion is slow but this motion as soon as this motion is fast you don't get accurate reading you have another sensor that works when the system is fast so the question here is and this is a very important question how would you combine these two to get me a best possible estimate of theta so theta acceleration plus theta gyro so how would i combine these two measurements to get the best possible theta any suggestions ideas Wait. give it some weight now let me let me start with something like this so i have two measurements i can average those so theta estimated and and, and i will go to the weights and how to find those so theta estimated is equal to theta acceleration multiplied by 0.5 plus 0.5 theta gyro do you agree with me this means most likely when the motion is in between slow or fast these uh, this averaging would work out if motion is super slow then i'm going to change this to 1 0 theta gyro if the motion is very fast then i would say 0 1 theta gyro do you agree with me as long as the sum of these independent these two measurement is equal to the final measurement what it means is this weight plus this weight equals to 1 this weight plus this weight equals to 1 this weight and this weight equals to 1 this type of averaging may work out are you with me so far this is the fundamental principle of a very important filter which is called as the complementary filter now the question comes is what weights should i choose should i choose half half or should i choose 10 or should i choose 01 change it in real time uh you can change it during real time and i wrote a paper on that changing those weights based on the uh, the error and error bar but let me let me try to a sort of give you a basic problem what is the characteristic we are looking at we are looking at when the motion is slow the weight on the accelerometer would be high when the motion is fast weight on the gyro would be high do you agree with me in other words somehow if i can add a low pass filter here and if i add a high pass filter here that 
that should help me what do i mean by low pass filter and high pass filter so i want to give you let's look at a maneuver uav is turning slowly or pitching slowly and then it's pitching fast pitching slowly and pitching fast if i want to show this behavior how would this behavior look in terms of theta acceleration and theta gyro so when the uav is pitching slowly it will look like this and it would look like this when the uav is pitching slow and fast the output from gyro is going to look like so if i were to do a low pass filtering if i were to do the low pass filtering i would combine this part of the solution and i would combine this part of the solution and i should be able to get the best possible estimate everyone understood this everyone understood this now in practical terms what do i mean by low pass filtering and what do i mean by high pass filtering before i actually give you the expression for low pass filtering high pass filtering i want you i'm going to give you two numbers i'm going to give you two numbers and i want you to tell me depending upon the behavior that we have seen depending upon the behavior that we have seen where would you multiply those numbers so i'm going to give you two weights one weight is 0.95 one weight is 0.95 and other weight is 0.05 so i'm going to give you two weights one weight is and this this is not the optimal choice but let's let me i want you to uh, give me some intuitive answers before we actually start the the filtering concept so how would you which uh, theta would you multiply by 0.95 and which theta would you multiply by 0.05 tell me clearly we had a choice half half that is not the best possible choice but it's one of the choices then i'm saying that okay i want to use these two numbers and i want you to give me an expression instead of zero multiplying accelerometer should i multiply that by 0.95 plus 0.05 gyro or should i write this expression 0.05 theta accelerometer plus 0.95 gyro you will be getting small values to sorry the small values to gyro because partial so here is an intuitive explanation before even we get into the filtering when you have pass motion you agree with me the output from gyroscope is going to be quite high you agree with me if you multiply that theta by 0.95 you are actually amplifying that drift gyroscope output is valid when the the motion is quite fast fast motion means clearly the value of omega is high value of omega is high which means value of theta is going to be high so intuitively it makes sense that if i want to design this complementary filter i would have a large weight on slowly changing quantity and i have a smaller weight on the quantity which is changing fast are you with me and believe it or not this strategy works very well now 0.95 and 0.005 what are those coefficients those are weights what do those weights decide those weights decide actually the bandwidth when the filter is low is acting in a low pass so 0.95 indicates this and 0.05 indicates 
this. So you have a low pass filter. Always remember, low pass filter is very, very useful when the quantity is not moving fast. That's what the low pass filter is supposed to do, right? So if the quantity is not moving fast, fast, low pass should allow it to go. If the quantity is moving fast, then the high pass would allow it to go. So this is the way a complementary filter is typically designed. Now the next question is, what are the exact values? What are the actual values that we should be looking at? And it completely depends upon the dynamics that you are interested in. Depends upon what is the bandwidth of the sensor. Is your accelerometer output good till five hertz? Then you will design the low pass filter bandwidth to be five hertz. Is your gyro better at after 10 hertz? Then you will actually design the high pass for 10 hertz. So this is the fundamental principle of pitch angle calculation. And in this particular pitch angle calculation, uh, the pitch angle is calculated from uh, X measurement. That's why it's using uh, cosine. Uh, but what you can do is it's the same equation, arc sine, and then you can actually find out uh, the, the, accel uh, the acceleration or the specific force divided by the count, and that gives you uh, the pitch angle. So what you do is you basically combine these two measurements, measurement from acceleration and measurement from gyro to find out the, the estimate of the uh, angle. Where would you use complementary filter? The fundamental disadvantage of Kalman filter apart from it being complex, is you need an underlying model, which means you need a mathematical expression. Many a times, the mathematical expression is not known. What you have is you just have two measurements and you want to combine those. When you don't have an underlying mathematical model, Kalman filter will not work. And your best option is to use a complementary filter such as this. The next thing uh, I want to talk about uh, real quick is you can use the exact same thing. You can use the exact same thing uh, if you are trying to find out the roll, which means if you want to find out the pitch and if you want to find out the roll, uh, you can use the exact same technique for role, but this equation and insert, I want to, so here is the question. Question. How would expression change for combined roll and pitch. So now the question here is, you have your quadcopter and this quadcopter is pitching and rolling at the same time. So I want you to visualize that the accelerometer, so basically I want you to visualize it actually pitched and then it rolled. So initially the IMU that you had, which was lying flat, when it pitched, you can find the pitch angle, but when it rolled, remember it rolled around the pitch. Do you agree with me? So you will have to take the cosine component of pitch while calculating the roll angle. So, so the question is, how would you find out theta P and how would you find out psi roll? And I want you to implement this in your uh, Mambo 
and I'll show you how you can do it. Any questions before I go any further? So this is going to be a, a simple task that from your Mambo, get the values of AX, AY, and from this AX, and actually you can do GX, GY, and then design a filter or complementary filter to find theta estimated and phi estimated. So these two things, let me see real quick. Okay, yeah, so these two things uh, we need to do. And what I would do is I will quickly uh, take you to the, the expressions, me is measuring yaw. So before I go to yaw, let me take you to uh, uh, MATLAB. And if you have MATLAB, please open MATLAB. So please open MATLAB. I'm gonna share my screen. So now you should be able to see my screen. And when you go to screen, uh, please open getting started. Uh, and this is the exact same uh, file that you run uh, when you start the, the Parrot Mambo uh, exercises. So you can use any of these. So you can actually use this altitude reference or you can use uh, the, the motor commands. That is totally fine. So you can use either this or you can use the motor commands. And in here, Please go to flight control system. When you go to flight control system, you will see this guy. Let me make it bigger. You'll see this guy. This is called as the sensor bus. So the sensor bus is going to capture the data from the IMU sensor, is going to capture the data from the barometer. And you would notice that this sensor bus most likely will have a, a closed end. So it would be terminated. What I want you to do is, I want you to go to Simulink, which is go to simulation, go to library browser, and when you go to library browser, uh, there is a commonly used block. 
which is out, grab that block from here, put it over here, and then you can connect. You will have access to those sensor values. So altitude sonar sensor, you can connect over here. Similarly, what you can do is you can actually take this and connect to the acceleration, X acceleration. You can actually connect Y acceleration. So you need to take this out. You need to connect Y acceleration. Then you need to connect Z acceleration if you want. You can also connect P, which is the output from the gyroscope. You can actually connect P. You can also connect Q, so now what you have is you have X acceleration, you have Y acceleration, you have GX, which is the gyroscope out, and you have GY. Everyone understood this. Now the key question is which how are the access for parrot mumbo defined? So parrot mumbo defined, say north is down. So if you see place a mambo in your palm, is front facing, that is uh, basically X, Y, and Z. So P is about X, Q is about Y, and R is about Z. So what I would uh, encourage you to do is, after this is done, go back. And can you see now you have access to all this data? So you can actually copy, paste, 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 and then you can actually see all this data. DX. Oh, so you can actually scope it this data dx dy dx dy you can actually measure p and you can measure q So once you do that, assuming there are no mistakes, you compile it, flash it, then you will get real-time data from your parrot mumbo. So you understood this? That would be the first step. The next question is, how would you estimate the values of roll and pitch by designing a complementary filter. The equation that you will use is the same equation that I derived a minute ago. So what I want you to do is, after you get this, I want you to combine the acceleration measurement. You will have to actually write a similar code to get the sine inverse. And then you have to actually get a timing uh, uh, stamp time stamp on the gx or gz and get the gyro measurement and then find out those two angles so what i want you to do is based on the acceleration measurement next step is you should be finding out the angle from the gyro measurement you should be finding out angle and at the end you should actually program a complementary filter that would give you 
the estimate of roll and pitch. Everyone understood this? Any questions in this task? Before I go further, I just want to make sure that everyone understood that what we are going to modify. Huh? I'm going to write it down. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that everyone understood that what needs to happen here. Okay. So here is the task for today. So as you notice that 90% of the grade, you already know because points are already given. So last 10%, uh, there will be small, small tasks like these with the hope that at the end, once you get to the task, we will have our line follower Mambo. So here is what we want to do. Modify uh, the Simulink file. File to get AX, AY, GX, and GY. This would be the step one. Any questions here? Any questions here? Then use equation data pitch is equal to arc sine uh, pitch. AX divided by 9.81 and use theta pitch is equal to gyro Y multiplied by delta T. How would you find out arc sign? There's a simulink function, mathematical functions. If you go to library browser, the simulating function that will give you the inverse of sine. Everyone understood this? The other way, uh, there is another shortcut that you can do is AX divided by 9.81 is approximately theta P in radians. As long as this is less than 17 degrees, this assumption will work. So if you don't want to find out the, the sign inverse, you can just use the ratio and then convert that into degrees. How would you get the timestamp? So once you run the simulation, you can actually read the current time. The gyroscope data should be coming at you at 100 Hertz. If it is down sample, you can actually get that data and then measure the timestamp and then you will get the value of theta pitch from gyro and accelerometer. Third, plot theta pitch accelerometer process time, theta pitch gyro versus time. And the last step is design a complementary filter. So zero can actually design. So you can do it like zero point. You can design a complementary filter to find out the roll angle and the pitch angle. So.
Who is not writing? So theta h estimated is equal to theta pitch from accelerometer plus theta pitch from gyroscope. And I want you to try with these values. So these weights could be 0 0.5, 0 0.5. You can change these weights to 0 0.95, 0 0.05. You can change these weights to 0 0.9 plus 0 0.1 and tell me the best weights that work. So this would be the assignment. This would be a very simple assignment. What you need to do is play with the simulink code that you already have, make some modifications and then estimate the pitch and the road. Online students, any questions? Any questions? Okay, start playing with this. Now the next part is, and this would be assigned, this assignment will be due next Venus, uh, next Tuesday. So I would encourage you to start working on this and I would add that uh, to the rest of assignments. Um, and I, actually I will make it visible and then you can actually work on this and then just submit a very simple one page report and your simulink file uh, as submission. So a short, Half a page report, half page report plus simulink file. In canvas. So this would be a small teeny tiny task that you have to work on. Now, in the case of roll and pitch, we were lucky because we had a gravity reference. But in the case of yaw, I want you to visualize as that UAV is going to yaw, the gravity reference is not going to change. So we need something else than just the, uh, the IMU. So for that, what we do, is we use magnetometer. So what is the purpose of magnetometer? Magnetometer gives us the absolute orientation with respect to the earth's magnetic field. So, and again, please understand that earth's magnetic field is not actually going through the center line of the earth. Uh, there is about 12 degrees, uh, 11 degrees of offset. That is called a declination angle. So if you want to use the magnetometer to find out the yaw, you will have to take into account this offset. But how would you do it is the procedure is exactly the same. So if you want to find out yaw, what you do is you find out the yaw from the magnetometer. You find the yaw from the gyroscope and then use a complementary filter to fuse these two measurements. Magnetometer is going to be accurate when that UAV is yawing slowly. The gyroscope, yaw gyroscope is going to be accurate when that UAV is turning quickly. So again, what you will do is you will design or you'll use a complementary filter to fuse the measurements from the magnetometer and the measurement from the yaw uh, gyroscope to get the value of yaw. 
Now, this, this is, there is an assumption here. The assumption is the magnetometer is placed flat. Only then it will give you the absolute orientation with respect to the Earth's magnetic field. If that magnetometer is at certain angle, then it's going to measure the three components of magnetic field. And your angles are not going to be accurate. So what is the way around it? So basically you use a magnetometer along with an IMU, maybe accelerometer to correct for orientation anomalies in the magnetometer. So if your magnetometer is at different angle, then what you will do is you would use the pitch and roll calculated from the accelerometer to correct that magnetic field. And that exactly what is being said over here, MXB, MYB, MZB are the magnetometer measurement when the magnetometer is inclined with certain pitch and certain roll. So here is what you know. You know that your magnetometer is oriented something like this. It's giving you an MX, it's giving you an MY, it's giving you an MZ. Remember that magnetometer is co-located with an IMU. So from IMU, you already know that with a complementary filter that you have designed, what is the value of theta pitch and what is the value of theta rho. Do you agree with me? So from the MXB, MYB and MZB, you can find out the projected magnetic vector MX. So from those body coordinate magnetic measurements, MX, MY, MZ, and please note, these are found out from your complementary filter. So from here, you can find out MXE and then you can find out MYE and using MXE and MYE, you can use this algorithm to find out the yaw. Everyone understood this? And we will implement this uh, in the next few classes. So what we are going to do is we will try to implement this code uh, in Simulink and I would encourage you to validate this logic uh, on the Mambo and then that should be able to give you the role, pitch and yaw for the Mambo. So that would be the simplest way you can actually find out the attitude of the quadcopter. Yeah. You will do it with actual Mambo because simulator will not give you the sensor measurement, right? So once again, if I was not clear, I apologize. So here is what the task is about. So in this task, you will start with the Mambo simulink file. In Mambo simulink file, you'll go to flight control system. In flight control system, you have sensor bus. You would open that sensor bus and output the AX, AY, and GX and GY. So exactly the way I did. Then use the equation that I have given you here to find theta pitch. And similar equation you can use for theta roll and then find out the theta pitch and theta roll from the gyroscope and plot theta pitch versus time from accelerometer, theta pitch versus time from the gyroscope and at the end, find out the estimated value of theta from a complementary filter. Everyone understood this? It will be a lot of fun once you start playing with an actual hardware. Does anyone have Mambo here? Okay, then you can try this. <laughs> okay. So next part is, how would you measure the, the yaw? For yaw, you need a magnetometer. And once you have the theta pitch and theta roll, 
from your complementary filter you can find out the projected values of the magnetic field once you find out the projected value of the magnetic field which is mxe and myE you can use this algorithm to find out the value of yaw so if you go down so you can find out this algorithm uh, so you will find out what are the values of mx and my so if mx is less than 0 you would use the first equation if mx is greater than 0 and my is greater than 0 you would use the second equation if mx is greater than 0 but my is less than 0 you would use the third equation if mx is 0 my is less than 0 you will actually use the fourth equation if mx is equal to 0 and my is greater than 0 you will use the fifth equation so that is how you would find out the yaw values uh, here is a simple example uh, wherein what you do is if you want to make your yaw measurement even more accurate please understand depending upon where you are on the face of earth the magnetic strength changes so there is an earth's magnetic model where you can feed the latitude and longitude that you obtain from the gps and it will give you the localized correction factors for the magnetic field in other words it will actually give you uh, the correction angles at that particular location so you have this magnetic field model you have the gps you feed that gps latitude longitude the magnetic model it will tell you the angular variation and that will actually give you even more accurate measurement but mambo does not have gps so we are okay with approximate values uh, and again uh, there are additional corrections uh, because of the coordinate frames that you can do uh, usually a simple complementary filter <clears throat> would give you a, a better estimate once you actually combine uh, the yaw measurement that you get from the magnetometer and the yaw measurement that you get from the yaw gyroscope a complementary filter between the magnetometer and gyroscope will usually give you a good measurement if you want uh, if your, your aircraft is big then what you can do is you can have two gps receivers and those two GPS receivers will estimate their individual positions. And then you can find out X1, Y1, X2, Y2, and you can find out the slope or that will give you an approximate value of yaw. But please understand GPS measurements are never accurate. They are varying. So this will only work if you have a long aircraft. Uh, but usually for quadcopters and the small UAVs that we uh, deal with, we can't use a uh, dual GPS signal. And this is exactly what we did so far. So we assume the rotation transformations are uh, identity. That's why the roll rate, pitch rate, and yaw rate that we get are approximated to the body roll, body pitch, and body yaw. And then we designed a complementary filter to combine the measurement from accelerometer and measurement from gyroscope. Now I want you to look at this expression very closely. You see that this equation is exactly similar to the equation that we wrote. The first part of this expression is the angle from accelerometer and second part of this expression is the angle from gyroscope are you with me so far any questions here but if you will see that there are some terms that are multiplying the first weighting factor and the second weighting factor remember this High pass filter is one minus the low pass filter. Remember when we selected the weights, the low pass filter we selected as 0.95. One minus 0.95 is 0 0.05. And that actually was designated as the weighing factor for the gyro or the high pass filter. 
So if you design a low pass filter, if you subtract whatever you have, you take one, subtract whatever you have for your low pass filter, what you have is a high pass filter. So I want you to look at the expressions on the left and the expressions on the right. Expression on the left indicates the low pass filter. So this expression is for the low pass filter. So this equation is for the low pass filter. This equation is for the low pass filter. And this equation is for the high pass filter. Can you see that high pass filter is nothing but one minus the low pass filter? Can you see here? Now, how, what decides whether it is low pass and high pass? And I don't know if you have taken a, a signal processing class or you will take signal processing class, but here is a very simple trick. Tau is a time constant. So it's a number. Okay, tau is a number. Uh, S is the quantity that is changing. That is an independent quantity that is changing. That is actually a Laplace transform. But I want you to understand in this entire expression, S is changing. Do you agree with me? On the left hand side, theta is function of S. On the right hand side, you have theta is function of s. So s is changing. So that is an independent variable. I want you to imagine that value of s to be zero. If my value of s is zero, what would happen to those weighing factors? Value of s is zero. What would be those weighing factors? One zero, you agree with me? If my value of S is very, very high, say infinity, value of S is very, very high. What will happen to those constants? Zero one, does it ring a bell? So basically S indicates uh, how slow or how fast the system is responding. In other words, the first equation is indicative of the dominance when value of s is small. So the first term is dominating when s is small. That is the typical characteristic of a low pass filter. Second term is dominating when the value of s is very big. That is an indicator, that is indication for the high pass filter. So now can you see that is called as single pole low pass filter and that is called as single pole single zero high pass filter but at the end they mean the same high pass filter is one minus low pass filter we'll stop here and we will continue our discussions on thursday uh, but before i close for today's uh, lesson